Section 2. Introduction. Quote, Plato and Aristotle. These are not merely two systems. They are also types of two distinct human natures, which from immemorial time, under every sort of cloak, stand more or less inimicably opposed. But preeminently, the whole medieval period was riven by this conflict, persisting even to the present day. Moreover, this battle is the most essential content of the history of the Christian Church, though under different names, always and essentially it is of Plato and Aristotle that we speak. Enthusiastic, mystical, Platonic natures reveal Christian ideas and their corresponding symbols from the bottomless depths of their souls. Practical, ordering, Aristotelian natures build up from these ideas and symbols a solid system, a dogma, and a cult. The Church eventually embraces both natures, one of them sheltering among the clergy, while the other finds refuge in monasticism, yet both incessantly at feud. End quote. H. Heine, Deutschland, Chapter 1. In my practical medical work with nervous patients, I have long been struck by the fact that among the many individual differences in human psychology, there exist also typical distinctions. Two types essentially became clear to me, which I have termed the introversion and the extroversion types. When we reflect upon human history, we see how the destinies of one individual are conditioned more by the objects of his interest, while in another they are conditioned more by his inner self, by his subject. Since, therefore, we all swerve rather towards one side than the other, we are naturally disposed to understand everything in the sense of our own type. I mention this circumstance at this point to prevent possible subsequent misunderstandings. As may well be understood, this basic condition considerably aggravates the difficulty of a general description of the types. I must presume a considerable benevolence on the part of the reader, if I may hope to be rightly understood. It would be relatively simple if every reader himself knew to which category he belonged. But it is often a difficult matter to discover to which type an individual belongs, especially when one's self is in question. Judgment in relation to one's own personality is indeed always extraordinarily clouded. This subjective clouding of judgment is, therefore, a frequent if not constant factor, for in every pronounced type there exists a special tendency towards compensation for the one-sidedness of his type, a tendency which is biologically expedient since it is a constant effort to maintain psychic equilibrium. Through compensation there arise secondary characters, or types, which present a picture that is extraordinarily hard to decipher, so difficult indeed that one is even inclined to deny the existence of types in general and to believe only in individual differences. I must emphasize this difficulty in order to justify a certain peculiarity in my later presentation, for it might seem as though a simpler way would be to describe two concrete cases and to lay their dissections one beside the other. But every individual possesses both mechanisms, extroversion as well as introversion, and only the relative predominance of the one or the other determines the type. Hence, in order to bring out the necessary relief in the picture, one would have to retouch it rather vigorously, which would certainly amount to a more or less pious fraud. Moreover, the psychological reaction of a human being is such a complicated matter that my descriptive ability would indeed hardly suffice to give an absolutely correct picture of it. From sheer necessity, therefore, I must confine myself to a presentation of principles which I have abstracted from an abundance of observed facts. In this there is no question of deductio a priori, as it might well appear. It is rather a deductive presentation of empirically gained understanding. It is my hope that this insight may prove a clarifying contribution to a dilemma which, not in analytical psychology alone, but also in other provinces of science, and especially in the personal relations of human beings one to another, has led and still continues to lead to misunderstanding and division. For it explains how the existence of two distinct types is actually a fact that has long been known, a fact that in one form or another has dawned upon the observer of human nature or shed light upon the brooding reflection of the thinker, presenting itself, for example, to Goethe's intuition as the embracing principle of systola and diastola, the names and forms in which the mechanism of introversion and extroversion has been conceived are extremely diverse, and are, as a rule, adapted only to the standpoint of the individual observer. Notwithstanding the diversity of the formulations, the common basis or fundamental idea shines constantly through, namely, in the one case an outward movement of interest toward the object, and the other a movement of interest away from the object, 
towards the subject and his own psychological processes. In the first case, the object works like a magnet upon the tendencies of the subject. It is, therefore, an attraction that to a large extent determines the subject. It even alienates him from himself. His qualities may become so transformed in the sense of assimilation to the object that one could imagine the object to possess an extreme and even decisive significance for the subject. It might almost seem as though it were an absolute determination, a special purpose of life or fate that he should abandon himself wholly to the object. But in the latter case, the subject is and remains the center of every interest. It looks, one might say, as though all the life energy were ultimately seeking the subject, thus offering a constant hindrance to any overpowering influence on the part of the object. It is as though energy were flowing away from the object, as if the subject were a magnet which would draw the object to itself. It is not easy to characterize this contrasting relationship to the object in a way that is lucid and intelligible. There is, in fact, a great danger of reaching quite paradoxical formulations, which would create more confusion than clarity. Quite generally, one could describe the introverted standpoint as one that under all circumstances sets the self and the subjective psychological process above the object and the objective process, or at any rate, holds its ground against the object. This attitude, therefore, gives the subject a higher value than the object. As a result, the object always possesses a lower value. It has secondary importance. Occasionally, it even represents merely an outward objective token of a subjective content, the embodiment of an idea, in other words, in which, however, the idea is the essential factor, or it is the object of a feeling, where, however, the feeling experience is the chief thing, and not the object in its own individuality. The extroverted standpoint, on the contrary, sets the subject below the object, whereby the object receives the predominant value. The subject always has secondary importance. The subjective process appears at times merely as a disturbing or superfluous accessory to objective events. It is plain that the psychology resulting from these antagonistic standpoints must be distinguished as two totally different orientations. The one sees everything from the angle of his conception, the other from the viewpoint of the objective occurrence. These opposite attitudes are merely opposite mechanisms, a diastolic going out and seizing of the object, and a systolic concentration and release of energy from the object seized. Every human being possesses both mechanisms as an expression of his natural life rhythm, that rhythm which Goethe, surely not by chance, characterized with the physiological concepts of cardiac activity. A rhythmic alternation of both forms of psychic activity may correspond with the normal course of life, but the complicated external conditions under which we live, as well as the presumably even more complex conditions of our individual psychic disposition, seldom permit a completely undisturbed flow of our psychic activity. Outer circumstances and inner disposition frequently favor the one mechanism and restrict or hinder the other, whereby a predominance of one mechanism naturally arises. If this condition becomes in any way chronic, a type is produced, namely an habitual attitude in which the one mechanism permanently dominates, not, of course, that the other can ever be completely suppressed, inasmuch as it is also an integral factor in psychic activity. Hence, there can never occur a pure type in the sense that he is entirely possessed of one mechanism with a complete atrophy of the other. A typical attitude always signifies the merely relative predominance of one mechanism. With the substantiation of introversion and extroversion, an opportunity at once offered itself for the differentiation of two extensive groups of psychological individuals. But this grouping is of such a superficial and inclusive nature that it permits no more than a rather general discrimination. A more exact investigation of those individual psychologies which fall into either group at once yields great differences between individuals who nonetheless belong to the same group. If, therefore, we wish to determine wherein lie the differences of individuals belonging to a definite group, we must make a further step. My experience has taught me that individuals can quite generally be differentiated, not only by the universal difference of extra and introversion, but also according to individual basic psychological functions. For in the same measure as outer circumstances and inner disposition, respectively, promote a predominance of extroversion or introversion, they also favor the predominance of one definite basic function in the individual. As basic functions, that is, functions which are both genuinely as well as essentially differentiated from other functions, there exist thinking, feeling, 
sensation, and intuition. If one of these functions habitually prevails, a corresponding type results. I therefore discriminate thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuitive types. Every one of these types can moreover be introverted or extroverted according to his relation to the object in the way described above. In two former communications concerning psychological types, I did not carry out the distinction outlined above, but identified the thinking type with the introvert and the feeling type with the extrovert. A deeper elaboration of the problem proved this combination to be untenable. To avoid misunderstandings, I would, therefore, ask the reader to bear in mind the distinction here developed. In order to ensure the clarity which is essential in such complicated things, I have devoted the last chapter of this book to the definitions of my psychological conceptions. End of section 2